And so there seems to have been an industrial zone along that ancient road. Um, there are also ancient rest houses. That's one of the ancient rest houses at the upper left, built in the 12th century. And uh, this is the kiln site which was discovered there. They went together with Bea uh, Dalrit, uh, who was from the Officer Authority. Uh, you can see we only excavated half the kiln. What we often do is just excavate one half of it and preserve the other half for future archaeological studies. That's what was done at the uh, Tokchai site here. And it turned out to be very strange. It's the only known example of its type so far. You can see in the uh, vertical view it has kinds of trenches dug across the kill. They seem to have been uh, secondary firing pits. Now in some long, and this is the longest kiln we've ever found yet, it's almost 30 meters long. Huge kiln. Now this is getting up to the stage of some of the so-called dragon kilns in China. Now the, the Chinese dragon kilns have usually have secondary openings in the walls where you can add fuel. And this may be what was inspired in the Khmer, but they, the dog care actually dug trenches through the ground and we found a lot of charcoal in those trenches. So it seems to have been maybe based on some kind of secondary ideas of what the Chinese were doing, but not eyewitness observation. So they, they, they figured out that, yes, you do need to make secondary firing areas for um, very long kills, but they dug trenches instead. So it was their own development. There was a kind of fusion, in other words, between Khmer and Chinese technology, but basically the Khmer, um, Khmer solution of the same problem, but a different way. Cross section there, you can see these um, in the, the vertical view. Unfortunately, so far, you've not found any of the chimneys on any of these sites. They're always destroyed. We never have the roofs. We only have the foundations. So we don't know at all yet what the roofs of the Khmer kilns look like. Very important parts of the kilns. And the chimney also very important. We don't have any of them so far. Now, Chomyak was the one we're going to work on. It was discovered by Kon Kasika. 2001. It's a very large complex, over 60 kilns, um, several different sectors. Most of the kilns in the northern part of the site, which is toward Phnom Penh, are already destroyed by encroaching urbanizations. Um, there have been three trial excavations last year in Kaseka, together with uh, Dominique Soutif from the Ecole Francaise. And they located eight sites, one of them 100 meters from Swat Zongyak, it was entirely destroyed by recent Chinese uh, kill, uh, tombs. Site 2 is 50 meters east beside a road, partially destroyed. Now, there's a, usually a mixture of stoneware and earthenware on the same site, which is interesting. Um, site 3 is a walled compound east of Site 2, again partially destroyed. And then south, Site 4 is 700 meters south, so there's the northern sector and the southern sector. Site 4 had one or two kilns. Site 11 is in the infamous uh, kiln fields zone, which obviously destroyed a lot of uh, kilns as well when they were um, burying their victims there. But this is now completely effaced by the Khmer Rouge activity, which is unfortunate because the shirts there are slightly different from the other sites. Each of the kiln sites may have had its own specific types of products, and they may have been built over a very long period of time. Site 5 is basically not a kiln, but it's a road with a lot of sherds in it, possibly self-glazed. Site 6 is nearby, it has a sherd concentration, fragments of kiln structure. In August last year, Pong Kaseka's team did an excavation there already, showed they came from the destruction of a kiln, so maybe these are the sherds which came out of Site 5. Site 7 is an intact mound um, corresponding to a kiln exited by Pon Kasika with support from this uh, French Saran Corps group. So the report of this is in French, which I'm not sure if any of you can read, if, but you can look at it if any of you can read French. And that's it, the, re the research on these uh, pottery workshops. That's an aerial view of Chongyak at the right where we're going this weekend already. And you can see it's still mainly rural, but beginning to be incorporated into Sierra Pen. Uh, this is uh, the layout of the kilns along the road there at the left side here. And at the right you see site one and the Chinese tombs from the background. Uh, site two, the partially destroyed kiln. Site three has a kind of uh, 
a couple of modern shrines built on top of it. Mount the kiln. Four is kiln in French. Um, site four, site of a now destroyed kiln. Um, site five, you can see that's basically a road, almost completely paved with potsherds. And these are some examples of the weirs found in the kilns at the bottom here. Um, site seven, yes, it was excavated by Pon Kaseka last year. And uh, that's site seven on your excavation at the upper right, and some of the types of pots found in it. These are some examples of the large decorated jars. So, in other words, it's a very complex site. They started to do a little bit of petrographic analysis of it, which shows that they would use clay from a wide variety of sources. So they weren't just fossilizing in one kind of clay, many different types of clay, several different types of temple, probably artificially added in. In other words, it's a very complex site, almost entirely destroyed, or very disturbed in other words. So it's very urgent that we do something on it right now. Um, we're probably not going to get very pristine materials to work on, but um, whatever we do, it's important because this is far southeast of the other kilns which have been excavated so far. It's down near the uh, sites uh, southeast of Phnom Penh on the way to the LKO area, so it could either date from the really pre encore period or it could date from the late encore period or even the post encore period. We just don't know. We have this one date of about 5th century, but we don't know what exactly the rest of the site refers to. Now, Khmer culture, of course, covered a much wider swath of Southeast Asia than just modern Cambodia, um, much of uh, Southeastern Vietnam, much of uh, Eastern Thailand also was part of it. Um, and in the 14th and 16th century sites, the Thai kilns began to expand. We have found shards of this material also in Cambodia. Burmese also, by the 14th, 15th centuries, also were beginning to make their own glazed wares as well in large quantities. They were glazing whole buildings. This is a large Buddhist site with completely glazed bricks used to construct it. These are some um, Myanmar. This is a Myanmar kiln, which also was making earthenware as well as stoneware. Uh, it seems to have also been a cross draft kiln, somewhat similar to the ones in Cambodia, but much simpler. Uh, this is one restored ancient uh, Myanmar kiln at the right, uh, with all the wasters and so forth there also. And you see the outline, it's the kind of slope inside the kiln. That's one important variable to study is that the kiln floors usually have a slope, which is meant to maximize the uh, effect of getting the suction of the air through the kiln. And that's one important variable to study in the Cambodian kilns as well. So I hope this gives you an idea of how what you'll be doing fits into a much larger problem. Studying the evolution of Southeast Asian pottery making, which started in the very early period, but the technology of it is a very important subfield to study because it relates to Asian uh, interactions, one of our themes in the, in the, the Monas Ruby Jaya Center. And it's also, this particular site is very important because it's seriously threatened. Uh, we hope to salvage at least as much as we can from it in the, the time that's left before urbanization takes over the whole site. It's a very nice area on the outskirts of the city, so it's a very good area to work in. And um, we hope that you will um, at the end of this, we kind of decide to become ceramic specialists. <laughs> but even if you don't, at least you know how ceramic data will fit into what kind of kinds of problems you will work on in the future. So let me stop here and maybe take one or two questions.